thank you very much for the introduction. And I'd like to thank the organizers for the invitation to deliver this lecture. I've looked on and followed the work of uh, the center. And so it's uh, exciting to, to be here and to dialogue with you. It's also a particular privilege, uh, as I imagine you've heard throughout the course of the lecture series to deliver it as part of the Miller Memorial Lecture Series. I never had the, the, the privilege of meeting uh, Dr. Miller, Professor Miller, in, in person, uh, but I did. Uh, first, I was introduced to him first through his writings and uh, the influence that they had on my own thought when I was particularly doing my doctoral dissertation on slavery in early Mesopotamia. Uh, but then also was able to correspond with Professor Miller, and what, uh, and uh, was really delighted to see his kindness and 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 warmth uh, in responding to a, a a lowly doctoral student at the time, and so it's very kind. Of them. So it's a delight to be able to um, to give this uh, lecture as part of this series. In 2008, Joseph C. Miller published the chapter Slaving as Historical Process, Examples from Ancient Med Med Mediterranean and Modern Atlantic. Miller desired to understand the historical process of slavery and open quotes, how and why certain people were currently resorted to this strategy from time to time and in place after place throughout history. Uh, end quotes. For Miller, the so-called historical problem of slaving entailed understanding the enslavers and those who were enslaved, as well as the related contexts and goals in which slaving occurred. In the process, Miller criticized the famous definitional approach of Orlando Patterson, who described slavery as, open quotes, the permanent, violent domination of natally alienated and generally dis dishonored persons, end quote. For Miller, this approach reduced slaves to making an historical difference only in open quotes, rebellion, preferably violent, mass revolt, that is no longer as slaves, but rather in asserting themselves outside their would-be master's control, end quote. Miller states, open quotes, historians might instead might better identify and appropriate for their analytical purposes the vitality that slaves, ineluctably human beings, possess, end quote. By so doing, Miller was considering not only the identity of slaves, as defined strictly by the relationship to their masters, but also the humanity of enslaved persons who form social relationships and possess identities as human beings. Drawing inspiration from Miller's approach and more recently Costas Vlasopoulos, uh, who cited the same quote as inspiration for considering the identities of slaves for, for the classical world. Now, by the way, I wrote my, uh, my uh, abstract before I saw his lecture, so. Uh, I didn't steal this from him, but I found the same inspiration. Um, but but drawing upon his lecture, having looked at it more uh, more recently, uh, this lecture will argue for the validity of studying imprisonment in ancient Mesopotamia as a historical process. So what I'm basically trying to do is is is, is take the idea that that Miller was proposing for studying slaving and say this is also a valid uh, approach to looking at imprisonment in the history of the world. Uh, particularly with ancient studies, I think we're seeing this more with modern studies of imprisonment, but with ancient studies, that method is not being applied yet. And so the questions uh, that are being asked, I think, are not sufficient uh, for understanding imprisonment as uh, an historical process. So questions such as who imprisoned, who was imprisoned, to what end and in what context will be discussed to understand the historical process of imprisonment. Uh, like slaving, imprisonment took a variety of forms and has been something that recurred throughout human history. This lecture will seek to demonstrate how the earliest historical records relating to imprison imprisoning uh, can be elucidated by considering the forms and functions of early Im imprisonment and will seek to show the importance of considering personhood in the study of imprisonment. But since time is limited, I will only focus on the identities of prisoners and offer some thoughts on how the reasons behind imprisonment can provide some basic, albeit imperfect, predictors of, uh, of treatment. The more specific and narrow application of this methodological tool for the study of imprisonment in particular contexts is for future uh, study. <clears throat> so this is the basic outline of my lecture, but I wanna start with uh, the prison. Um, uh, Mesopotamian studies, particularly from social history and in and, and many other ways, uh, we've, we've sort of sometimes can fall prey to uh, the desire of being the first. The, the significance of our information is, is that we're the first this and first that. It goes back to Kramer's uh, first in the history of the world because we have um, among, if not the earliest writing systems. And so um, sometimes though, I think asking social historical questions, asking the question of first is really distracting. Uh, Mesopotamia did not have the first prisons, 
if you're looking at imprisonment from the way in which we understand it today in a modern political context. And so the question of first is not so helpful. I'm not arguing at all that there's a connection uh, or some sort of evolution or linear relationship to imprisonment today and imprisonment then. Um, that's not a particularly interesting question to me. But I do think that because when we think about what is a prison, we look at it through the lenses of our current context, it's helpful to begin to think a little bit about uh, how do we understand what the prison is. So the prison is typically considered a particular institution that relates to incarceration for punishment. That's how most people will do a standard definition will be it's for punishment. By extension, prisoners are often thought of as persons who are being held as punishment. A narrower approach to defining prisons is helpful insofar as it prevents flattening the historical study of social institutions, but the larger inquiry into the history of prison imprisonment should not revolve around the question of whether or not, and if so, to what extent, imprisonment from antiquity conforms to our more modern institutional practice of detaining the body. That is, the inquiry into the historical phenomenon of imprisoning should not be dominated by modern Western approaches that are largely determined by changing political realities and at times reflective of the state of functions of prisons rather than their actual use. I think this is where more recent studies are actually helpful if we're looking at more modern studies of, of prison. What we describe as a prison is not actually, doesn't always square with what's happened in historical reality in the modern context. In the United States, from which the distinction be, uh, between jails and prisons is largely derived, the jail is meant to be a place of holding until punishment or for short-term local punishment while the prison is intended to be used for punishment often for the state or federal government. Even with these distinctions in place, the jail and the prison were used in, in the United States in a, in a variety of ways that go well beyond their stated functions or their normal functions. For example, jails and prisons were also used to, in response to the abolition of slavery to coerce labor, provide access to cheap labor through work programs, enforce segregation, ensure disenfranchisement, and provide a means of control, controlling the minority population by the dominant culture. By so doing, imprisonment was adapted to enforce cultural norms in a new and changing political context of the United States that also involved securing access to coerce labor through the creation of new laws that had attached to them the right and threat to imprison for failure to comply. While this is but one example, as the system of the United States has been overly influential, in my opinion, in the theoretical and definitional study of prisons from an historical perspective, it demonstrates why historians must seek to differentiate between the stated functionality of prisons in the modern Western world and their actual use in the same manner that social historians who work on antiquity must disentangle propaganda and literary visions from everyday social realities. What is of more historical import is not only how the prison was conceptualized, but how it functioned and was used by those with, pow with the power to detain the body. Indeed, many studies in modern imprisonment are considering the functionality of prisons, which is more complicated reality of mixed functionality in different places and at different times around the world and in the United States. I can't quite see it on, on my screen, but I think you can see it from this, the PowerPoint. Uh, this, um, this book, uh, David Starback, uh, actually defines prisons and jails in, much, in a much similar manner. Uh, he sort of broadens it beyond the U.S. distinction to look at how imprisonment has occurred uh, in different global contexts. And I think that's a very helpful way uh, of thinking about it. But here are some of the key books, I think, that have um, just a handful uh, that are helpful in looking at this question. The broader inquiry into imprisoning as an historical process it helps to explain how the body has been detained throughout history to meet a number of social goals by those in power. In fact, it's my contention that the multiplicity of applications for detaining the body is precisely the reason why humans throughout history have returned time and again to the practice of imprisonment. By controlling the body, but limiting physical damage done to the control, imprisonment can be utilized for numerous social ends, which contribute to the proliferation of imprisonment and its multi multifunctionality. It also offers some explanation as to why humans throughout history have chosen to imprison. Uh, this lecture is primarily concerned with ancient Mesopotamia. This is just a graph for those who may not be specialists. Um, uh, Vitaly, you can ignore this, just go to sleep really quickly. Um, uh, but this lecture is primarily concerned with ancient Mesopotamia. Um, the, the large cuneiform tablets represent 10,000 or more um, tablets found in a place. 
Uh, the, the next size, the medium size, is between a thousand and I can't quite see it on my screen between a thousand and ten thousand, and then four hundred to five hundred found in the smaller sites. And this is so it it has to have about four hundred or more to even register on this map. So just to kind of give you a little bit of of, of idea about the amount of information we have from the ancient world, in particular Mesopotamia. So I'm I'm concerned today with ancient Mesopotamia, which is in southern Iraq today, between the the Tigris and the Euphrates. From the invention of writing around 3200 BC until cuneiform came into disuse, over 100,000 cuneiform texts uh, distributed across the Middle East remain extant today, predominantly in southern Mesopotamia. In the course of this lecture, I'll be referring to a variety of text types. Imprisonment is attested in legal texts, personal letters, administrative documents, a law collection, a literary text, and rituals. When I refer to a text, I will mention the type of document and period, and will also note if the text reflects ideology or social practice. More defined and detailed studies tied to particular period periods is for future projects. Now, since I'm attempting to argue for an approach to studying imprisonment in ancient Mesopotamia, I'm going to be drawing upon texts from different periods. These periods may be conveniently summarized as followed, and the bold as follows, and the bold ones are where I'll be drawing most of my examples from. So most of the examples will come from the third and second board. So who was imprisoned? I want to begin with the historical actors. In ancient Mesopotamia, imprisonment was not regulated or standardized. Now that does not mean that just anyone could grab and detain someone off the streets. The laws of Ornama, paragraph three, for example, deals with the only mention of imprisonment in the extant law collections. It should be noted that these are likely not actual laws with juridical function. So they're a collection of laws like the laws of Hammurabi uh, most scholars don't believe they had juridical function uh, attached to them. Uh, this text, uh, which I'll return to later, is only cited here as an example, uh, but the general reality was that there was some measure of accountability with respect to detention, in clear, which is clear in other text types. Uh, this particular text relates to the inappropriate detention of someone. Now, as I said before, I'll return to this text when discussing functionality for imprisonment, but it's important to note that although imprisonment was not regulated in any formal or narrow sense, detention could be imposed, could not be imposed just on anyone unless the one detaining had cause or was in some uh, position of authority, whether derived authority or otherwise. In fact, in administrative uh, texts and personal letters that deal with imprisonment, the person guarding or detaining someone was often clearly under the authority of other persons or entities. So what I'm trying to say is you can't find a standardized approach but it doesn't mean that you could just go around and grab everybody in the streets and keep them in your basement. Not the bad basement, but you get the idea. Now, the places where imprisonment is attested also provides information about who was imprisoning and, and for what purpose. Imprisonment is attested in palaces, temples, workhouses, and in private households. Those who imprisoned were also were sometimes called guards, but anyone acting on behalf of the state or more generally any responsible person could detain another until they were instructed what to do with a prisoner. Imprisonment is most, attest most attested, as would be expected, in administrative contexts related to officialdom. Now, these attestations relate to labor coercion and accounting documents that re recount who is holding prisoners, sometimes providing additional information such as length of time, rations provided, and, re and the reason for holding them, though any of this information could be admitted in the documents depending on the purpose of writing. Imprisonment in ancient Mesopotamia had four primary functions. Detention because of suspicion in relation to a crime, in relation to debt, uh, remand or to force payment, and for the purpose of labor coercion. An overwhelming majority of offenses that resulted in someone being detained were not because the person was being punished. Rather, the individuals were being held as part of the judicial, uh, judicial process, either prior to judgment or while waiting for punishment. Further, imprisonment could also be used to force payment in relation to the offense. As a result, there is a diversity of what we often term crimes that are mentioned in relation to imprisonment, but this is not because imprisonment was a punishment for those crimes. Still, towards understanding the multifunctionality of imprisonment, the numerous causes behind the detention are worth, worthy of mention here, since the reasons behind imprisonment offer some insight into uh, who was detained. Um, the reforms of Uruk Haganah, the early dynastic texts, which I will mention later, include, uh, includes people being uh, imprisoned uh, because of debt, false measures, theft, and murder. Uh, for the old Akkadian period, 
there's uh, Klaus Vilka discusses a couple of fragmentary attacks that read like prison rosters. Uh, they mentioned flight, theft, arson, and murder. There's also another example he's connected to it, which involves plundering houses for the same period. For the Earth Re period, we also see, we can add to this making false claims or retaining silver. For the old Babylonian period, someone is being held uh, for making an insolent remark to the son of their master. Uh, there's also uh, detainment or detention that occurs in relation to theft. For old Babyl Babylonian Mari, uh, someone can be held in the Nepharu, which is um, a sort of workhouse where people are confined and coerced to work. Um, people are, are up here and there for unpermitted uh, travel during wartime or uh, because of uh, simple assault. For the Middle Babylonian period, individuals are listed as imprisoned for offenses such as beating a mother, uh, taking possession of a slave of the temple, striking an older brother, and attacking a bowman, for example. And to these, we can also add to the Neo Babylonian period theft, fraud, and other offenses. Now, as stated before, the diversity of these crimes relates to their to the use of detention for judicial process and was not tied to, uh, and, and this list could surely be expanded upon since imprisonment was not tied to a particular crime or sets of crimes. Imprisonment was a multifunctional mechanism to control the human body in response to several issues and to achieve several goals. But only looking at the offenses, whether committed or alleged, as well as only considering if they were debtors or workers being forced to perform tasks does not consider such prisoners as complete persons. This is why it's useful to think intentionally about prisoners as human beings or imprisoned persons. Like slavery, being a prisoner is a conferred identity that is imposed upon another person but fails to touch on the totality of an individual or groups of individuals. Uh, Costas's paper, or Costas Blasopoulos' paper I mentioned earlier, Enslaved Persons and Their Multiple Identities, which was delivered as part of this uh, lecture series sought to provide an analytical tool for the consideration of slaves in antiquity and their more complex identities rather than mere categorization of slaves. Uh, since the study of slavery has been dominated by the conferred identity, uh, particularly in the ancient world, by the conferred identity of the relationship between slave and master, uh, he drew upon uh, identity studies to distinguish between, open quotes, different forms and kinds of identities. Now, I regret to tell you that I wrote a paper also doing this. Um, on, on, on slavery in early Mes or in, in Mesopotamia for an identities volume. And you know, with, with editing volume, edited volumes, that's that's where a, a place that's the place where good ideas go to die, right? Mm -hmm. So it was it was uh, written back, I think, in 2016, and I've not seen it yet. Um so <laughs> but you know, these things happen, it happens with with edited volumes. But uh so uh, I've I've done this with slavery, I've tried to do this with slavery, and none of you have been able to see it, uh, if you would have been interested. Um, and um, uh, so, but he, but but uh, Vlasopoulos, uh, building on others, uh, building on other studies, uh, discusses three types of identities uh, to be considered when looking at slavery and slaves from a historical perspective. Categorization is the first identity that he considers. Um, and, by, and by the way, when I did write that chapter, I, the inspiration was from other work that that Costas has done. So, um, give credit to him. For that, um, so the ca categorization relates to the classification or label uh, conferred upon slaves. This is the primary vantage point from which slaves have been considered in scholarship. Self-understanding relates to how a person perceives themselves. Of course, there is overlap between self-understanding and categorization, as a slave would understand their status and conferred identity, but their, the categorization would not encapsulate who they are. They would be wives and daughters, husbands and sons. In Mesopotamia, some would be craftsmen, others would be foreigners. Uh, so while they would know their category as slaves, humans are complex individuals with self-understanding and perceptions that extend beyond mere categorization. Finally, group, groupness is the third aspect that Costas discuss. For groupness to be achieved, um, persons must share in a common category, but shared categorization is insufficient for groupness. Groupness extends beyond mere categorization to include uh, awareness of that categorization in some sense. Each of these aspects of identity assist in confer considering the individuals as more than slaves. This analytical tool would not only be helpful for considering slaves in ancient Mesopotamia, something which I attempted to do in another uh, chapter, uh, I, I want to argue that these aspects may also be 
apply profitably to prisoners in both contemporary and ancient societies, so that the humanity and complex identity of prisoners are not lost. By looking at, a prisoner, as pris at prisoners as more than their categorical identity, one can consider their historical significance as human beings rather than mere prisoners, and in turn see imprisonment as historical process. As Miller argued for considering the humanity of slaves in historical studies, the same can be applied profitably to the study of prisoners and imprisonment as well. Just as seeing enslaved persons as more than their relationship to their master, considering imprisoned persons from a historical perspective helps the historian to see prisoners as more than their conferred identity. The social relationships, professions, familiar relationships, and other facets of their lives make up the imprisoned person. Prisoners are also workers, mothers, fathers, daughters, and sons. They are servants and slaves. Some are merchants, while others are potters. And yet, while prisoners are more than their conferred identity, when banded together through their shared experience, they also can rebel in response. But as Miller warns with the study of slavery, rebellion is not the only and even primary way by which prisoners demonstrate the historical significance uh, that they possess as human beings. There is more to this vantage point than just attaching the concept of personhood to prisoners. The importance of these social relationships and factors inform our understanding of how imprisonment functioned in its various ways and provides some insight into the context of imprisonment. Rather than an imposition upon the evidence and a desire to attach personhood to these to those living life at the margins of society, these factors help to clarify the evidence and are also reflected in some of the texts themselves. For example, viewing prisoners as persons with social lives beyond their confinement, and even because of such social complexity, deserving of compassion, is attested in the evidence from antiquity, which is perhaps surprising. And what follows, I will, dis I will discuss texts that offer insight into prisoners as more complex individuals and seek to demonstrate how that social complexity is sometimes uh, is sometimes taken into consideration. The point of this lecture is not is, is not to work through all of these identities. The goal is to show the validity of using utilizing such an analytical tool. As stated before, as the point of this lecture is thinking through the more complex humanity of prisoners for the study of imprison imprisonment, contextual expressions are the focus here. I will draw upon personal letters, literary texts, monumental texts, and even a ritual as part of this discussion. It is important to note that the argument being advanced is not that all of these texts provide accurate accounts of how prisoners were viewed. The point is rather that thinking of, of prisoners as complex individuals with complex identities is not an attempt to sneak personhood through the back door or void of the evidence. These documents provide primary source material to contemplate who prisoners were. Further, it should be noted I will draw upon several periods in, hope, in hopes of establishing the validity of looking at prisoners in imprisonment through these lenses. The more detailed look at imprisonment in historical perspectives that consider particular periods is for future projects. I will begin with a first count account sent by a person um, uh, sent by a person who let a prisoner go. In an old Babylonian personal letter, a person who was guarding a prisoner explains why he chose to set the prisoner free. The explanation offered is that he had pity for the prisoner and had him released after the prisoner expressed concern for his family. This letter includes the self-perception of the prisoner as a person with a family. In response to this, the guard is moved with compassion to respond. That I told him in the presence of the director, and I had detained him for four days in the house of the director. Then he came to value his life and said, my life is at stake, my family shall not be scattered. When he said so, I felt pity for him and had him released. In this text, the author of the letter released the prisoner because he pitied the person. When quoting the prisoner, the sender found it worthy to cite the prisoner's concern for his family and how his detention would affect them, potentially resulting in the prisoner's death and the scattering of his family. This demonstrates an early awareness of the social and familial impact of imprisonment, but other even earlier examples of such social concern can be cited here in relation to imprisonment. Indeed, a well-known trope of kingship in ancient Mesopotamia that is actually uh, apparent in, 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 in the Hebrew Bible as well involves setting the prisoner free. A very early example of this is found in the early dynastic texts from southern Mesopotamia, reforms of Urakagana. Uh, the, the K-A is all caps there because we don't know how to pronounce it. And so um, it's, a, it's just representing the sign that's present. Uh, so it could be iri inim uh, ina, possibly. Um, but the reforms of Urakagana is a multi-columned chronicle text from about 2400 BC. The text is preserved in two complete columns and one further fragmentary column. The so-called reforms are a monumental celebration of various wrongs that Urukagana fixed during his reign, particularly in relation to the land. 
the text and ones like it form an early basis for the pre and precursor uh, to later law collections like those of laws of Renama or the laws of Hammurabi. Such texts also serve as precursors to later monumental texts that celebrate uh, the king as just and a defender of the weak. While the reforms that are mentioned are not confirmed in documents of practice, the selection quoted here touches particularly on the defense of the weak as it is, relates to the various types of prisoners and is worthy of mention here since it at least demonstrates the concept is present and worthy of note. Although it is unclear if these things happen, the concept of the king acting on behalf of prisoners is, is held forth as something that a good and pious king would do. Reforms which involve establishing justice in the land and express concern for the vulnerable of society were considered pious acts that demonstrated the fitting nature of rulers and helped to support the claim of the divine right to rule. For the reforms of Urukagana, the prisoner belonged alongside other vulnerable members of society, such as the orphan and the widow. This demonstrates both the recognition of the end of the vulnerability of the prisoners and how they are worthy recipients of protection and release by the king. The early Sumerian terminology for release, amagik, is literally understood as return to the mother. While the idea that one returns to the station of their, of, of their birth, the familial context of this language is worthy of observing here. Since in the following text, uh, the child is not just returned to the mother, but the mother is returned to the child. Early evidence deals with the separation of families because of death. One ruler in Metana uh, claims to have offered a remission of debt and reunited mothers with their children and children with their mothers. And Metana reigned in Lagash for about uh, at least 19 years. And in this text, uh, which was written on a brick that commemorates in Metana building the reservoir for a can canal uh, during the early dynastic period, it is possible that this text was written near the early part of Metana's reign, potentially in connection to his ascension to the throne. This text is one of the earliest precursors of the, the tradition notably performed by certain old Babylonian kings in particular, who would offer debt remittance when they were ascended to the throne and on other occasions. Hammurabi does it, I think, four times, if I remember. Uh, while this example uh, in, in, in this text has not been confirmed in documents of practice, we do certainly know that the uh, later old Babylonian practice is uh, verifiable. But in this text, in Metana wants to demonstrate his fittingness to rule and val validates this in part by claiming that a remission of debts uh, was declared. The act of reuniting families, which was claimed by Metana, was something to be celebrated and commemorated on a brick, demonstrating that Metana was a good ruler and therefore a fitting choice by the gods. Again, it is unclear that these, that these reforms occurred, but it remains a possibility since debt remittance was known in later periods. We simply don't know. While this text does not mention imprisonment, debtors are those imprisoned in Urukagana, and it's debtors, it's, it is debtors who are imprisoned later through debt slavery and found imprisoned. For, um, uh, so debtors are also held as part of debt slavery in early Mesopotamia and also appear in imprisonment contexts. But more to the point, imprisonment was one of the many ways in which families were divided and separated from one another. By reuniting families, the text alludes to how debt resulted in families being separated, a practice well documented in early Mesopotamia and clearly documented in the ensuing periods. Now, since the goal is to think of imprisoned persons instead of simply prisoners, it is useful to consider the broader familial context and impact of imprisonment. There are a variety of factors that must be considered when assessing the general impact of familial separation had on households. First, members of a household work to contribute to its overall, overall well-being. This was done in a variety of ways, whether working for the household through food and goods production, fulfilling any corvée service that might be owed to the palace, working externally as day laborers, provide, providing uh, future security and a means of getting access to credit. When a family member was in prison, this placed pressure on the household to secure the release and also made members of the household take on or cover the normal contribution that a family member made to the household. Secondly, as formal models that viewed persons from antiquity as lacking affect for their children due to high rates of mortality have been reconsidered, it is fitting to also understand that members of a household would, be, would desire to be reunited with their loved ones for less practical and more social reasons as well. For this reason, as human beings, um, the motivation to regain prisoners related to a desire to reunite familial households for both practical and social or emotional reasons. While there are other texts that deal with imprisonment of family members for failure to fulfill work requirements, uh, it, it's attested in the Earth III period 
as well as in the middle Babylonian period where a person runs away from their work responsibilities and a family member can in, end up imprisoned as, as a, a consequence of this. Um, but I want to focus a little bit on a, on a slightly different reality. Uh, the familial impact imprisonment had on families is reflected in a middle Babylonian text that deals with a father standing as a guarantor for his son. In the text, the son who was in prison had fallen ill. In the following text, Rabbi Sha'ili, a son of Kitatu, uh, ran away from Uruk. Uh, the text does not provide any information on the type work of work being performed or the profession of the individual who fled, opting only to include patronymics. Uh, in this instance, the prisoner grew ill and his father became his guarantor. The practice of having a guarantor for the temporary release of prisoners is well attested in this period, the Middle Babylonian period. The process involved shifting responsibility to a different party with penalties for failure to keep the prisoner. The cause behind the imprisonment appears to have shaped the sort of responsibility that the guarantor would be taking upon themselves. In this instance, the process of becoming a guarantor provided access to the prisoner for labor or some other benefit, but it would be unlikely that other guarantors would readily present themselves outside the family since the prisoner was ill. Because the mention of illness is included in this text, it seems likely that illness was the primary reason for the father stepping forward to act as the guarantor. It could simply mean that the father is assuming care for his son and guaranteeing that the son will be available when the time arises, but taking the responsibility upon himself. While well, as will be discussed below, the institutional context serves as a predictor of treatment for the prisoner, insofar as rations are concerned. Institutional care did not likely involve caring for the sick. So in this instance, the father stepped forward and took responsibility for his son. In this instance, it demonstrates that the prisoner was also a, a son and responsible, and responsible for his care fell to his father when he became ill. The impact on the family, however, was not the only motivating factor for release articulated in the text. Compassion towards the person of the prisoner is also a text attested in a literary text called Ahim de Nungal. Now, it's, impo uh, it's important to note that I do not think that this text articulates how prisoners were considered, but it does fit into a stream of ideology that came to be attached to notions of imprisonment in ancient Mesopotamia. Ahim de Nungal is one of, the, one of the literary texts that were frequently cop copied during the Old Babylonian period as part of, of an intermediate stage of uh, scribal training during that, during that period. Paul Donero, in his dissertation, collected 49 texts uh, to produce a comp composite score of this text, the Hymn to Nungal. Uh, most of these, uh, and, and a key addition to this is Adinger, um as well. Uh, most of these artifacts came from Nippur and can be dated to the Old Babylonian period, while uh, Pascal Adinger uh, believes that this text was composed during the Earth III period. The text does not reflect factual, uh, factual everyday imprisonment. The Nungal's role in the prison are clearly documented, or imprisonment are, is clearly documented in legal documents that show her place in some judi uh, judi uh, judicial process. Nungal's role in judicial practice is seen in legal texts like Yursa RA 91 and Wienhoff 2003 for the Festschrift uh, Vilka, uh, both of which are legal texts dealing with the judicial process during the Old Babylonian period. Festschrift Vilka. Uh, te the, that text uh, involves a dispute and mentions oaths that are taken at the throne net, uh, which is one of two oaths taken in this in the text, one to support and demonstrate truth and the other to bring the matter to conclusion so that the dispute is not revisited in the future. Of interest is the mention of the oath uh, taking place at the throne net, which is known to be related to Nungal. So while the, this, this literary text provides little information in terms of faithful attestation to everyday life, Nungal was connected in some instances to actual uh, judicial process, to, uh, to, so particularly at Sippar uh, in relation to where Shamash's cult was, uh, who was the god of justice. Um, now, this literary text celebrates the prison goddess Nungal, and it provides an embellished intellectual tradition from antiquity of how imprisonment could function in ritual purification of prisoners. The literary text is fitting to cite here as it provides an intellectual tradition attached to imprisonment and prisoners, which articulates compassion towards the person of the prisoner. The selection quoted here celebrates Nungal's role in sparing a guilty prisoner from punishment. The section celebrates the compassion and justice of Nungal. The compassion in view was not directed toward, towards an innocent person, as one might expect. Instead, the text is clearly discussing compassion directed towards a person found guilty through the ritual process of the river ordeal. Uh, which was an ordeal that was used to settle disputes and determine guilt before the gods, often in the deified river. 
As such, the ideal of compassion, at least in this instance, was not extended only to the innocent or wrongfully confined. The concept of compassion and the possibility of positive change through a ritual process was attached to the guilty person. While I've written elsewhere questioning the extent to which one should expect imprisonment to result in positive change, something more worthy of note is also in view. The Hinton Mundal is a bit more consistent in that it envisions a way that past offenses can be dealt with. Now, while compassion towards the prisoner was contemplated as a positive action, it's interesting that the inverse is true as well. In the Shirk series, uh, a failure to show compassion or harm the prisoner is found in a list of offenses that need to be dealt with through ritual process. The Shirk series, which literally means burning, was a collection of uh, incantations lightly gathered between 1350 and 1050 BC. Uh, during the Middle Babylonian period, though many of the individual Sherpa incantations probably belong to an earlier period. Tablet 2 involves a priest who, who invokes the gods on behalf of a person who is unwell because of some unknown offense. And so since it's a ritual, you've got to sort of cover all your bases. You start going through this litany of possible offenses. And this one, uh, this instance point contains about 95 instances, which could be possibly the uh, a potential cause behind this instance of illness. And a variety of impious behaviors are listed, including a lack of, of, of compassion for the prisoner. In this instance, the failure to care about prisoners is listed alongside other actions, such as separating family members and friends. This, of course, follows the logic of the text. Imprisonment separates a person from their normal social relationship. So it fits with a list of other offenses that involve separating family members or friends. Such a caring attitude towards the prisoners is something that needs to be dealt with through ritual, and failure to do so could result in illness and likely stems from the early ideology of justice attached to kingship and arguments for the divine right to rule on behalf of the gods. It is striking to see that the ideal of compassion for imprisoned persons and their relations celebrated, as well as the contrasting indifference or even negative actions toward persons, uh, towards prisoners condemned in the evidence. If the, if the release of prisoners contributed to the ideology associated with pious behavior, the lack of compassion towards prisoners is on the opposite end. Of course, this does not suggest that imprisoned persons were treated well, or people generally had compassion upon them and took them into consideration, or considered their personhood. In fact, the rather poor and harsh treatment of, of prisoners in general likely resulted in the recognition that prisoners were vulnerable people. Like all of life, imprisonment in ancient Mesopotamia was complicated. And in, 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 in general, it seems that imprisonment was intended to be and was, in fact, quite miserable. These two things can be true at the same time. There were at least some there was there was at least some notion that concern should be showed for imprisoned persons and their families. But at the same time, the overwhelming reality was that imprisonment was miserable. This is seen in several ways. Uh, first, an old Babylonian letter, the uh, place of imprisonment is described as a house of of famine or distress. Uh, this personal letter was written uh, from a person named Belshunu to his lord. The exact nature of his uh, of the relationship between these two individuals is not explicit. Addressing someone as my lord is, is a common honorific title uh, used to refer to a person of higher authority. Belshunu was also refers to himself as your servant while smearing logogram Arad uh, for the Akkadian Wadum has a semantic range that re can refer to a slave the term is also employed as a way of showing deference to a person of higher status. In this case, the letter does not appear to be written by a slave to a master, rather uh, the letter was sent from a person of le lesser status to an official of higher status. In the letter, Belkinu, who was being held in connection to a break-in, claims innocent and identifies several dis distressing aspects of imprisonment in which he is held. Now, because I realize that I'm, I'm, we started a little bit late and I'm going a little bit long, combination, which is deadly. Uh, I'll skip forward uh, um, to another attestation. Uh, the, mis the misery attested in the record uh, in relation to imprisonment appears to have been common enough for such misery to take on significance in literary texts and in a ritual practice. Uh, such reception of the harsh ex experience of prisoners took on ideological and ritual significance in texts such as the Emden Gaul referenced earlier in which suffering could be used to produce a positive effect on the prisoner. The suffering experienced in the, the prison was to cause the person to respond with lament, which in the literary text had the ability to purify the prisoner ritually. Now, from this literary perspective, the suffering caused uh, in prison produced weeping and lament, which in the text had a purifying effect 
in relation to ritual. Uh, that's, so the idea is not that they were made better just because they were singing. You know, sometimes you have music programs, for example, in prisons today. That's not what's going on here. This is a ritual that takes place. It's a formal ritual of, of singing lament, and then the person is purified. And the prison is then appears later in ritual texts, uh, such as the Beat Salome or the House of Water Sprinkling, where a king is actually uh, imprisoned overnight and has to say uh, personal prayers and um, and through this process is then able to then receive back on the royal regalia. So stripped of the royal regalia, goes through this imprisonment as part of the process, says these prayers, and then is sort of then purified in the process and brought back out. Um, Klaus Ambus, who's done some great work on looking at this, um, the king in the, in the prison, uh, says this, the prison was code for social isolation, exclusion, illness, misery, poverty, and the distress of a person abandoned by his gods. So this is why it was fitting for the king to enter into a prison. The suffering in the prison and the accompanying prayers were to purify the king and make him ready to assume his role. Returning to more personal accounts, the suffering experience in prison is attested in other non-literary texts. In a personal letter from the Old Babylonian period, the sender mentions the beatings that an individual was receiving. And he's afraid that this individual will be beaten to death, that he will die if he's continued to be held. The beatings are mentioned in this letter, and, and they are occurring as part of a judicial and investigative process. While the final result is not known from his time in custody, the possibility of death while imprisoned is clearly known in early Mesopotamia. So while suggesting that personhood should figure into the study of imprisonment and a basis to do so is found in the evidence, this is not intended to mean that the concerns for imprisoned persons was the norm. If such variation in perspective existed and variation occurred in treatment, other than the whims of guards, what factors help to predict or at least relate uh, to such outcomes? Now, um, in, in a different life, I would have presented on this more thoroughly, um, but in, in, to what ends, I think what we see is, is that in general, when someone's being held in order to uh, coerce labor, um, they are generally, there's a level of institutional um, provision, at least in terms of rations, because you're wanting to uh, access the labor of the individual, okay? So you, you wanna provide at least a basic level of care typically in order to, to continue to provoke benefit from the work of the individual. Whereas when someone's being held as part of a judicial process, they seem to be more vulnerable in the evidence and more subject to needing to depend upon their social network in order to receive food or or receive uh, basic uh, care. And you can see this with different texts. Uh, in this part, I was going to discuss about how punishment probably is not in view and talk about a couple possible exceptions uh, and, and then mention some examples of death that occurs both in private and institutional contexts. Uh, and so I think what we see, though, is emerging as you look at the evidence is, is that that generally, if you're trying to extract labor from an individual, some basic level of care does seem to be often in view. Whereas if you fall, if you are detained as part of a judicial process, especially if you're of the lower stratum, you seem to be more, uh, more vulnerable. So, a couple of areas for further study and applying this. <clears throat> Imprisonment occurred in palaces, temples, workhouses, and private households. These contexts relate to the treatment and function of imprisonment. But historical and geographical contexts also provide fruitful avenues to explore the nature and multifunctionality of imprisonment in ancient Mesopotamia. This is an area which needs to be explored mo much more, but I'll highlight just a couple of contextual considerations for future investigation. Uh, for example, um, runaway workers um, from the lower stratum were pursued and imprisoned, likely in the Old Akkadian period, certainly in the Earth III period, not in the Old Babylonian period, but then again in the Middle Babylonian period. Why does this happen? Why do these changes occur? Looking at this aspect of, um, of social history can help speak to broader political context. Or most people who were held, we do know how long they were held for. Uh, most of the text tell us how long a person's held for. What we do know, it's usually pretty short term. But then there are unique examples, uh, highlighting this graph from, from a monograph, um, that, that sort of there are spikes at certain times during the rules of reign uh, of, of various rulers, during the reigns of various rulers. All of these are from the same historical period, the Earth period, so the same dynasty. 
But there's a spike around the early years of Shu Sun's reign, one of the kings. Uh, what contributed to the use of imprisonment for longer periods, even up to over three years in one example? Why did that change? Uh, so looking at these, um, applying this sort of broader methodology to more specific uh, local cases, I think it are, are avenues for more, uh, for future exploration. Miller argued that historians should pay attention to the significant slave possessed of human beings and not just their historical significance as seen through rebellion. I've sought to demonstrate the same is true for the state of imprisonment as well. Questions asked about imprisonment in ancient Mesopotamia typically focus more narrowly on why a person ended up in prison, how long they were held, and for what reason. While these are useful points of inquiry, by looking at prisons, prisoners more holistically, their historical significance is not just what they may or may not have done and how long they were held. It's not just their time living under guard or if they were left. They were imprisoned persons who intersected with imprisonment as part of more complex and comple uh, complete lives. By looking at those tasks with guarding and prisoners, the ends of detention and the context in which imprisonment occurred and changed, imprisonment as a multifunctional approach to control the body can be seen as a historical process. Thank you.